Today is Wednesday, April 19th, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 45 tonight, so I want to invite you to take a Bible and be turning with me to Genesis chapter 45. We'll be there in just a few moments, but we're glad that you've joined us tonight. As we always do, we want to invite you to be with us in person, if at all possible, this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. We're jumping back into our ongoing a study of the book of Isaiah. I've enjoyed being in that class. And then at 1030, we plan on getting back to our study of Hebrews in sermon form. We're working our way through that book. And we'll be looking at about the last one third of the chapter of uh, Hebrews chapter six. So I hope you can join us this coming Lord's Day morning. And we're also getting together for a fellowship dinner after worship this coming Sunday morning. And hope you can all join us for that. Talk to Gary or Sarah if you have any questions. But uh, bring enough food for you and your family and a guest or two. And we'll look forward to uh, sharing that fellowship time after worship this coming Lord's Day morning. As always, if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, uh, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you. If you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we would invite you to do that as well and uh, sign up for the notifications so you know whenever we have uh, new material out there. So thank you so much for doing that. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings written by the prophet Moses. And tonight we're looking at the life of Joseph. He's now in charge of famine relief in the land of Egypt. His brothers have come down from the promised land to Egypt to uh, purchase food. Uh, Joseph holds Simeon hostage until they could bring back his youngest brother and his dad's favorite son, Benjamin. They finally bring Benjamin back in spite of Jacob's protest. They load up food, they head back home, but Joseph has his favorite silver cup hidden in Benjamin's sack. So the Egyptian officials chase him down. The brothers basically say, we don't have your silver cup. And if you find your cup in our stuff, you can kill whoever has it. And you can take the rest of us to be your slaves from here on out. Well, the Egyptian officials search their stuff. They find the cup in Benjamin's sack. And the officials bring them all the way back to Egypt to face the wrath of Joseph. And that's where we left it last week. They bow down before Joseph yet again. I think that was the fourth time, if we've counted correctly. And uh, Joseph is just grilling these guys. And so he's letting them have it. As far as they're concerned, they're getting ready to lose their youngest brother, which would just be absolutely devastating for their father, Jacob. And at this moment, Judah steps forward. He has had some tremendous spiritual growth over the past several years. He offers his own life in exchange for the life of Benjamin. Let Benjamin go home to dad and keep me here as your slave in Egypt. And that's where we left it at the end of Genesis 44 last week. So that brings us to Genesis 45. Verses 1, 2, and 3 is where we start this week, the first paragraph. Genesis 45, and let's start out with verses 1, 2, and 3. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Uh, this is one of the most awesome passages, I think, anywhere in the book of Genesis. We've been building up to this for a number of weeks now, and I hope we realize that in terms of the amount of text, we've actually had more build up for this event right here than we've had for the entire account of the flood. Have we ever thought about that? The flood is just a few chapters long, and we've been building up to this for several chapters now. Uh, we've had more about this than the creation itself. And so God created the universe and everything in it in a couple chapters, and we've spent more than a couple chapters studying Joseph. And so this chapter is absolutely huge in terms of its impact. And sometimes I wonder, why do we have more information about Joseph in Egypt than we have about all of these other very important events in world history. And personally, I think it's probably because this explains how the people get to Egypt in the first place. If you remember, the first readers of this account are the Israelites as they wander in the wilderness, somewhere between Egypt and the Promised Land. And Moses is writing this material, as I understand it, as he's traveling along in the wilderness. So he has this audience in mind. And I think the question on their minds would be, 
if we're heading for the promised land, and if Abraham was there at some point in the past, why in the world have we spent several hundred years in Egypt? So they need to know this. This is relevant material. These are their people. Uh, these people are practically Egyptians at this point. They've been there for hundreds of years. They were born and raised there. Their parents were born and raised there. Their grandparents were born and raised down there. So this is very relevant. How did we get down here? And so if Abraham was given the land and he was on it at one point, how did we get to Egypt? So this section of Genesis gives the background information on this. And that's just kind of fascinating to me, maybe explaining why there's so much material on this and uh, why we have such a small amount of material on the flood and creation and so on. So Joseph then, as he just grills his brothers over taking the silver cup, he finally can't take it anymore. And he just breaks down in tears. But before he gets to that point, he just orders all the Egyptians to leave the room. So he's in this room alone with the 11 brothers, and he just starts sobbing, out of control, sobbing, practically screaming as he cries. So people can hear him all throughout the royal residence. His crying pretty much is echoing through the halls of the palace. And he finally just blurts it out when they're alone together, I am Joseph. And notice his very first question immediately is, is my father still alive? If you remember, he's asked this before, but several more weeks have passed, and so he wants an update. His father is very old at this point. He's in a uh, very fragile condition. He's concerned about his father and his father's health. And so he knows this. He knows dad is old and frail, and he's worried about him, and he's wondering if he's ever going to get to see him again. So this is the question that he wants to get an answer to. The brothers, though, they're shocked. They hear this. And as I see it, their jaws hit the floor, as we might say today. I mean, even to the point where they literally could not even give an answer. They can't say anything. This is too much. It doesn't compute. They can't even think about this. They can't even really think about what it means for them personally. And this is a combination of shock and terror. Absolutely no response here at this point. They are just dismayed at his presence. So let's continue then in this account. This is Genesis 45. Let's look at verses 4 through 8, the next paragraph. Genesis 45, verses 4 through 8. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth, and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. The brothers are speechless. They are terrified. As we noted in that previous paragraph, they are dismayed. And so Joseph has them come closer, and maybe he gets down off the throne, maybe he gathers them around, but he tries again. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. I love that. Uh, not the other brother Joseph, as if there was another, but I am the one. I'm the same Joseph that you sold into slavery, as if there's any doubt about that. So this is something that only the brothers would have known. Uh, even Jacob didn't even know about this. So this isn't something that anybody can make up. Uh, this is like somebody answering the secret security question on some kind of online account. This is something that only you would know. This is a very private, very personal information, but it's terrifying information. And so this is Joseph saying, I haven't forgot about this, guys. You know, I know what you did to me, is what he's admitting here. <laughs> it's me, and it's the same me that you guys beat up and threw in the pit and sold into slavery. Um, at the same time, though, Joseph makes a point of telling these men not to be angry with themselves. And at this point, they're probably thinking, oh, no, th this is not good. So he says, don't think that way. Don't be angry with yourselves. And he explains ultimately that God is behind this. So God used you to preserve life through me. In fact, if it weren't for you selling me into slavery, people would have died. That's what he's saying here. Perhaps even millions of people would have starved to death if this hadn't gone down the way it, that it did. He explains, though, that the famine is just getting started. They are two years into a seven-year famine, so we've still got five years left. And I do find it interesting how Joseph says that they still have five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. In other words, they are so confident in Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams that they won't even bother plowing or planting. 
Of course, normally I would think after two years of drought, I'm thinking that you might plant, hoping for the best. Well, I mean, surely it can't go three years, and so you would plant that third year. Uh, but these people, they are sticking to the plan. They are not planting any of their grain. They are saving that to eat, which normally would not be a very wise move. You normally you'd want to get back on your feet and start sowing and, and reaping again. But they're holding off based on Joseph's interpretation. Down in verse 7, I love how Joseph says that God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to uh, keep you alive by a great deliverance. So he's saying, I am a forerunner. God is using me. He's saying, and these people are a remnant. And uh, th this is a concept that we're going to see later in Scripture as God uses small groups of survivors to do some amazing things. So instead of using huge nations and powerful militaries and vast financial resources, a lot of times God will use a small group of survivors, a remnant as it's discussed here, as it's mentioned. And so I would take this as a practical encouragement to us uh, just because we may be small in number doesn't mean that God can't use us. So we want to be the remnant. We want to be used by God. As I was studying for th this lesson tonight, I was thinking back to a time in a missions class down at Freed Hardeman University where we had a veteran missionary come in and give some advice and teach a class and kind of explain what it means to be a missionary and how to prepare for that. And I remember him saying one of the challenges is that when you go onto a mission field, a place like China, for example, you may go for an entire week from one Lord's Day meeting to another without seeing any Christians in the community, without running into anybody that you know from church. And he was saying, you need to prepare for this. This is this shocking thing. And having grown up in the Chicago area, I remember hearing him say that, and I remember thinking, that's the way it is. <laughs> In the north, we are so few and far between, you may not have another believer in your high school class. You may not have a member of the congregation that you see during the week. And that made a special uh, impact on me as I thought about that again this week, because so far this week, I have run into two of you, uh, members of the church here, outside the assembly, randomly, without anything being planned. And I won't call you out publicly like this, but uh, I, I saw one of you a couple mornings ago at the Farm and Fleet down in Verona. That was a nice surprise to run into a, a Christian brother down there. And then I ran into a Christian sister getting off the elevator at UW Hospital yesterday. Uh, not planned. She was there to see somebody else. But I thought that was so cool, uh, especially after that uh, warning from that veteran uh, missionary many years ago. You know, be prepared not to just run into people like that. Uh, so that was a pleasant surprise. Um, but I'm just saying we want to be a remnant. Uh, God can use small groups of people. We are few and far between. This isn't like some small southern town with a church of 300 people and a population of the town of 5,000 where you're going to see people at McDonald's and the grocery store all the time. But uh, a small group of people certainly can be used by God. Um, so what do most of us think of when we hear the word remnant? What, what is the context of that? And if we hear that word remnant today, what are we most likely talking about? I don't know about you, but uh, I think about a carpet remnant, don't you? Uh, when I hear the word remnant, that's what's on my mind these days. A, a carpet remnant is a small piece of carpet that's saved from a larger project. So it's a cutoff, uh, maybe an odd size. It's not needed to finish that other project, but, but they hold it aside they preserve the good condition of it, and then they use it ultimately for something very important. Uh, years ago, one of our people got a carpet remnant and had it bound to be used as a very customized runner for the back of our auditorium. They don't make runners that size. So if you're at the back of our church building, across the back there, between the cubby holes and the front door, uh, that's basically a remnant. Kind of an odd size, but it was uh, rebound and uh, given some new life there. And you can't buy a piece of carpet that size, so that was custom for that spot. But it was perfect for its intended purpose, although that piece of carpet might not have ever been used for anything else. So I think the same goes for us as God's people. We may not be strong in number. We may, we may be kind of unusual, uh, kind of odd here and there. As a church, we're not overflowing with material resources. But God can use us in some amazing ways if we allow it. So I just take that as a brief lesson from this reference to a remnant. God can use small groups of people to do some amazing things. I also find it interesting in this passage how Joseph says that God had made him a father to Pharaoh. He was Pharaoh's father. What does that tell us about Pharaoh at this point in Egypt's history? He was probably young. 
Remember, Joseph is in his mid to late 30s, so I'm thinking that this particular pharaoh was probably younger than this, just based on this father reference. I think that's a safe assumption to make. We know in the ancient Egyptian world, sometimes pharaohs were very young, sometimes uh, children, sometimes in their teenage years. And so uh, God then has made Joseph uh, not just a father to Pharaoh, but God has also made uh, Joseph Lord of all Pharaoh's household, ruler over all the land of Egypt. If you remember from our study a few weeks ago, Pharaoh put Joseph in charge, and that is repeated here. This is confirmed in this passage. So he's in charge probably because Pharaoh himself is quite young. So this young Pharaoh faces this problem with the interpretation of his dream. They look for some wise man to take over, and Joseph is the guy. And so this young Pharaoh probably looks up to Joseph in some sense. So at this point, Joseph rules the world. So let's continue then with Joseph uh, and what happens next. This is Genesis 45, verses 9 through 15. The next paragraph, Genesis 45, verses 9 through 15. He says, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have there. I will also provide for you. And there are still five years of famine to come and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterward his brothers talked with him." We still don't have much of a reaction from the brothers yet, other than being speechless. But Joseph tells them, go get dad. Go bring our father down here. Tell him that God has made me Lord of Egypt. And you will live in the land of Goshen. So I just want to point out, this will be a long-term scenario. Notice he says, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks and herds and everything that you have. So you're moving. You're not just visiting here for a week or two. We're not going back and forth with wagon loads of grain, but you're coming down here. And this will be for at least the next five years so that you do not, do not become impoverished. In verse 12, uh, Joseph starts trying to convince his brothers that he really is who he says he is. You see with your own eyes, it really is me who's talking to you. So I'm thinking if you were there, you would have seen this disbelief. Is this really our brother? So go tell dad about my splendor. Bring him down here. And then he hugs, he weeps over Benjamin, followed by the rest of his brothers. And after the weeping and hugging, once they get that out of the way, they talk together for a while. And I certainly wonder what those conversations would have been like over the next few hours as they get to know each other when it, <laughs> once again. Uh, only if we could uh, kind of listen in on that. But what an amazing reunion that must have been. So let's go on and let's continue with Genesis 45, 16 through 20. That's the next paragraph. Genesis 45, 16 through 20. Now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are ordered. Do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourselves with your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So now we have Pharaoh's reaction. When Pharaoh gets wind of the fact that Joseph's brothers have come down, he's thrilled by this. Uh, Pharaoh invites them to come down to Egypt as well. Only here he's promising them the best of the land. And that's awesome that he's giving them the best land. However, do we anticipate any issue with this? Do we anticipate any long-term problems with Pharaoh, especially a young Pharaoh, giving these foreigners the very best of the land? What crossed my mind as I was reading through this paragraph several times was this. Who do you think owns that land now? Who's on the best of the land of Egypt at the time they were kicked off. Who gets kicked off of their land at this point? I'm thinking the best of the land, probably a wealthy family, 
probably an influential family, probably a politically connected family. And here this young Pharaoh basically says, you leave, we're going to invite Joseph's family from up north to come down, and we're going to give them this land instead. So I want us to understand, Pharaohs do not live forever. And so I think we may anticipate some resentment down the line long term. It's, it's an amazingly generous offer, and it's great for them but maybe not too wise over the long run. But we'll get back to that somewhere down the line. Uh, for now, though, Pharaoh tells this family, don't worry about your stuff. Just move here, and the best of the land of Egypt is yours. And we do understand. I mean, Joseph has saved the nation. And so it's natural then for Pharaoh to want to try to show some appreciation for Joseph's family. Well, let's continue on with Genesis 45, 21 through 23. Genesis 45, 21 through 23. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of garments. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. As they get ready to go then, Joseph sends them on their way with wagons, uh, provisions for the journey, and clothing, but he gives even more to Benjamin. Remember the problem with favoritism in this family? Uh, it continues on, even through multiple generations. He also sends along some very valuable gifts to his father, I think a care package, we might say, including donkeys and grain and bread, a variety of the best things of the land of Egypt. So let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph in chapter 45. This is verses 24 through 28. Genesis 45, 24 through 28. So he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the journey. Then they went up from Egypt and came up to the land, or came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, for he did not believe them. When they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons, that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I laughed out loud when I read verse 24 again. As they leave, Joseph says, Do not quarrel on the journey. What could these brothers possibly have to quarrel about? <laughs> Well, they may try to blame each other for who did what 20 years ago and so on. Uh, that, that's, uh, that'd be a challenging trip. I know siblings have a way of not getting along on long trips. And so I think Joseph, as a very wise man, anticipates this. So this was a pretty intense trip. And Joseph wants to make sure they make it home to go get dad without selling anybody else into slavery along the way. That's the way I would look at that little reference. So they get home to dad. They let him know Joseph is alive and ruling over the land of Egypt. And he doesn't believe it. But once they explain what Joseph said, once Jacob sees the wagons and the things and the gifts, he finally believes his spirit revives. And his goal at this point is to see Joseph before he dies, which I think indicates that uh, he was in tough shape physically. And, and spiritually and emotionally as well. This man is not well. And Joseph is concerned about him. And it seems here that Jacob uh, is apparently concerned about himself in that this is now his goal. I want to make it to see my son before I die. Well, this brings us to the end of chapter 45. In terms of a practical application, I'm thinking we might learn something from Joseph's willingness to reconcile with his brothers. Of all people who've ever had the right and the ability to take revenge. Joseph has to be somewhere near the top of that list. Here he is as a young man, terribly wronged. I mean, wronged by having been beaten up by his brother, sold into slavery, the false accusations, the years in prison, being forgotten about, and on and on and on. And now he has this incredible power. And now his brothers show up. They are begging, falling at his feet, begging for food. Joseph could have very easily taken advantage of that situation. But Joseph forgives. He has the power to take revenge, but he refuses. And instead, he reconciles. He makes things right. 
And in that regard, it seems to me that Joseph may be an example for us today, especially in family situations. There are some messed up family situations. People do terrible things to each other. And I'm thinking of what Paul wrote over in Romans 12, verses 18 through 21, when he said, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And to me, it seems like Joseph demonstrates this perfectly, even to the point of feeding his enemies. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Now, sometimes it's not possible to be at peace with all people. But Paul says that we are to be at peace, if possible, so far as it depends upon you. And that is certainly what Joseph does here. He had the power to take revenge, but he holds back. So we're now ready for jo uh, Jacob's journey to Egypt in Genesis chapter 46. Hopefully we'll get to that next week. We'll get to a big reunion coming up. But for now, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day, 930, for studying Isaiah. And then turn 1030 back to Hebrews, the last few verses of chapter 6. And don't forget the fellowship dinner after worship this Sunday. We're so thankful to have a building of our own where we can come together. And so if you have any questions about the dinner on Sunday, get in touch with Gary or Sarah. Uh, basically, bring enough food for you and your family and a guest or two. And uh, plan on sticking around after worship. I am looking forward to, to that. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as the God of Joseph, a God who loves his people and provides for them, sometimes using some amazing and creative ways. Father, we know that you love us, and we pray for your ongoing providential care in our lives, for our daily bread, for safe places to live, for so much more. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for, for being merciful to us and to our families. Thank you for our church family. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.